Yeah, I'd like you, if you would, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Mark and chapter 8 as we continue looking at uh, this idea of Christ who is our sanctification. And we're looking at it from two ways. One is uh, holy living comprises, of, on the one hand, feeding on the lamb, and on the other hand, actively removing leaven from our lives. And we talked about this leaven. It's a picture of of sin or evil in its permeating character, just like yeast spreads through the whole batch of dough, then sin always spreads, always affects everything it touches. And so we want to think about uh, the fact that leaven, as just we said, the lamb, you're going to see the lamb all the way through the Bible. You're going to see leaven permeated throughout the word of God as well. It's going to be all over. The scriptures because of the effects of sin and how the Lord uses leaven to describe sin in different ways and different aspects. And so in Mark's gospel, chapter 8 and verse 15, he says, he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Now we already saw the, the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now he talks about the leaven of Herod. And of course, Herod was a compromiser. He was trying, on the one hand, to please the worldly and the religious, the Jews and the Romans, and always because he wanted to maintain power himself. And so he's constantly compromising. He's a, he's a politician, a consummate politician who is trying to maintain his place and play the game to keep in that position of power. And so the law says that one of the things that can really trip us up is compromise. Try and keep everyone happy. And it's impossible to keep everybody happy. And so uh, really what we've got to think about is our primary responsibility is to please the Lord. That's the one who we're going to give an account to. I'm not going to give an account to my brethren. I'm going to give an account to the Lord Jesus. And so I may preach a message, and it might be just the perfect message for this assembly, and nobody might like it in the assembly. But it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. Is, is it what God wanted said, and is he approved of the message? Remember, politicians... Uh, and I approve of this message. Here's a question. Does God approve of this message? That's really what matters, right? And so we've got to be beware this idea of compromise, uh, of trying to keep everybody happy, and especially if we've got something to lose by being faithful to God. See, Herod had things to lose. He had to lose his position. He, lose his, he didn't want to lose anything. And so the leaven in his life was this position of, of compromise because he didn't want to lose what he had. Are you glad that John the Baptist wasn't a compromiser? Right? I mean, and he lost his head, right? Yeah. And he lost his life, but he didn't compromise. And, and the Lord says there was nobody born among women like John the Baptist, right? Why? Because he had this desire to be faithful to the Lord. And so watch out. This is something to beware of, this leaven of Herod. Now look, please, at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew 16 and verse 6. Matthew 16, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now notice every time the Pharisees get mentioned. Like the Lord hates hypocrisy. And so he, he mentions that over and over again. Then he says, and of the Sadducees. Okay, so now we've got another group. We've seen Herod, Pharisees, and now the Sadducees. Now look at Acts 23, and we get a very clear description of who the Sadducees were. And they were the modernists or the liberals of their day. They were religious. The high priests, actually the high priestly family were all Sadducees. But they were very religious, but they were liberals who denied the supernatural. Acts 23, verse 8, 
He says, for the Sadducees say that there's no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection, don't believe in angels, don't believe in spirits. I don't know how they get on with God because the Bible says yeah. God yeah. is spirit. <laughs> so, yeah. And so basically they're liberals, modernists, if you like, of their day. They deny the fundamentals of the faith and the authority and sufficiency of scripture. In fact, when the Lord was contending with the Sadducees, one of the things that he kept saying to them is, have you not read? Have you not read? It was, did you not read your Bibles? That's what he says to them. They were reading them, but they were reading them very selectively. And, and so they were people who really did not believe in the fundamentals of the faith. And yet they were amongst the people of God. That's the danger, you see. This is why the leaven is dangerous, because it's among the people of God, and leaven spreads, you see. And so if you allow somebody in your assembly who begins to espouse liberal ideas concerning the role of women, as an example, just to, I'm just thinking of one off the top of my head. It, pretty soon, one person throws off the biblical teaching, and it won't be long before there'll be others following suit. That's how it works, right? And so watch out for leaven. Watch out for this. And watch out for the leaven of the Sadducees. Now, what is very difficult is that in our world, in the 1800s in Germany, something emerged. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it has to be said. It was called higher criticism, where, where men began to set in judgment on the word of God. They sat in judgment. on. Now, that's not the way it's meant to be. The way it's meant to be is the word of God is meant to sit in judgment on us, not us sitting in judgment on it. But these highly intellectual German thinkers began to question the authorship of books like Moses and Isaiah and Daniel, and all the rest. And, and so they began to question. And the interesting thing is that this leaven spread. It started in Germany, but it went over to England. And it began to affect the schools in England. And then it went to the US, and it began to affect the seminaries in the US, like Princeton, and Harvard, and Yale. And these, these were preacher schools. I don't know if you realize that the Ivy League schools started for the purpose of training preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to spread the gospel across America. And now they are dens of iniquity. And it all began in Germany. Have you ever wondered how Luther's Germany became Hitler's Germany? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, this is the, the land of the Reformation. Justification by faith, the Bible in the hands of the people. And it became Nazi Germany. How did that happen? It happened in the 1830s, not in the 1930s, in the 1830s in German universities, where they began to question the authority of the word of God. It affected lots of areas, even down to the Bible you're reading. You ever read your Bible and you see notes that say, well, actually, the woman caught in adultery in Acts chapter 8 is not in the, the older manuscripts, right? And that's evolutionary theory applied to the scriptures. Older is better. Nonsense. You try reading that contextually without the woman caught in adultery, you've got serious problems. And so it affects every area. And so we've got to beware. The Lord says, take heed. Right? This stuff spreads. And it always weakens and undermines. We, we have a Bible that's lost its authority in the minds of the populace. 
because man has sat in judgment in the word of God rather than the word of God sat in judgment for them. And so he says, watch out for Sadducees, this humanistic and rationalistic way of looking at things. Watch out for this. This is leaven of the highest order, and it's like a cancer that eats away in everything. So watch out. Watch out for this stuff. And yet there's a certain sense which there's a bit of a Sadducee in each of us. In the sense that we, we wouldn't deny any fundamentals of the faith, I don't think. But we say we believe in an eternity in the lake of fire for unsaved people. Right? Would you believe that? That lost people will be in hell for all eternity? And yet we live as if it's not true. So in a sense, we, we, we give mental assent to truth, but we live like we're Sadducees because it doesn't grip our souls. We live as if it's not really true. So we've got somehow, Lord, there's the spirit of a Sadducee in me just as much as the spirit of a Pharisee. <laughs> and I need to purge it out. And I need to believe your word and live like it's real and, and make sure that I act it out like it's real. And so he says, we've got to watch out for this leaven that is so permeating. Look at Galatians, please. We're just going to keep going here on this topic of uh, leaven because it, it is an important topic. And I realize we still got five festivals to do and only two sessions, but we'll, don't worry. We'll just have to fasten our seat belts tomorrow morning and uh, we will we'll make it. Galatians chapter 5. And verse 9, Galatians 5, verse 9. He says here, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, the context in Galatians is the leaven of false doctrine. And in their case, it was the mixing of law with grace. And you see this leaven of false doctrine in other assemblies, too. Uh, in, there was a leaven of false doctrine that had come into the assembly in Corinth. That some people were saying that the resurrection was already passed, that there is no resurrection from the dead. Uh, there was a misuse of gifts. There was, there was doctrinal leaven in that assembly too. And, and so we've got to be careful. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so even today, increasingly, you see, there was a day when in some ways to shepherd an assembly was relatively easy because most of the teaching the saints in the assembly got they got in the local assembly or they got in conferences. And they usually go to the right conferences. So it was pretty easy. But nowadays, you got Christian radio and you got YouTube. And there's some dubious people on YouTube now. I mean, some good people on YouTube too, but some dubious people on YouTube. And the idea is this, that you can, you can pick up YouTube theology. And how do, how do the shepherds keep an eye on what people are looking at on the internet? Even, even supposedly Christian things, never mind the other stuff, right? Very difficult. And so uh, I was in one assembly and uh, there were people espousing the flat earth theory. You know, that the earth is flat. I mean, it's a big, big group. Of, it's on YouTube, you know, I mean, don't go there. Don't waste your time. <laughs> but there's a lot of people. Now, it's bad enough to get people to take us seriously when we believe in creation itself okay don't make it harder than it needs to be right with this flat earth nonsense but this is in us i'm talking about in an assembly here i'm not talking about in some you know weird old place this is an assembly people are spout where do they get that from they want to talk from the platform talk on youtube and they were embracing youtube theology even books. There, there are popular authors who are teaching heretical things. I'm going to name names here. John Piper, very popular author. His view of God is obnoxious. It really is. And yet how many Christians feed on John Piper? A God who chooses to damn people for all eternity? Just capriciously? I mean, this hyper-Calvinistic nonsense. Like, this, is, this is the world we're in, right? And we've got to be, be upfront about this. 
there's leaven of false doctrine, and it only takes a little bit to affect the whole assembly. And I've seen assemblies being torn apart by false doctrine. A little leaven. Leaven's the whole lump. And so we've got to be careful about this. And, we, and, and it's hard for spiritual leaders to protect the flock these days because of all, they can't shepherd, you know, they can't go out, I want to check your library, make sure what's in there, right? Well, sure, I want you to send me a list of everything you look at on YouTube. Like, like you know, we can't do that. It's hard to police. But we got to recognize what leaven is like. And the leaven of false doctrine is a poison. It's a cancer. It affects people. And, and even Christian bookstores now, they're dangerous places. When I was a young Christian, I didn't know any better. I mean, I go into a Christian bookstore and I figured it was a safe place. I've come to learn it's a very dangerous place. And there's a lot of stuff in there that you'd be better off not reading. And, and so we, we've got to watch out with this. And then, of course, the leaven of evil conduct, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 6, where he talks about, your glory is not good, know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lot. And here we're talking about moral evil. There was a guy in the assembly who was involved in an incestual relationship. Something that even in those days, now it wouldn't be hardly anybody of that I think today, but in those days, even the Gentiles were shocked at that. Okay, But it was going on in the assembly and the assembly was tolerating it. Maybe they just felt, well, we, we've got great liberty, you know, in our assembly. We enjoy our freedom. So they weren't dealing with this. And the problem is, if you don't deal with sin in the assembly, if you don't exercise discipline in the assembly for moral failure, and it's not that we want to punish people, but, but we do have to discipline people as a warning that God is holy, and he takes sin seriously. And if we don't discipline, then others will think, well, if he can get away with that, then I can do this. You see? And, and it spreads, you see, because it lowers the bar for everybody. We can get away with this stuff. And so that's why we must exercise discipline. Now, discipline is always with a view of restoration. Always. It, it's so that they'll repent. We're cutting them off. From, from the joys of fellowship and the privileges of fellowship, so they will see their error, they will repent and be restored to the assembly. That's the whole point of it. It's not vindictive in any way, but it's this idea that we're, we have to protect the testimony because the assembly, in a sense, represents the one who's the head of the assembly, which is the Lord Jesus. And if, if our moral conduct is as shocking to the Gentiles, then what kind of a testimony is that in the world? If we're doing stuff that even they wouldn't think about doing, how are we ever going to win them to Christ? You see? And so there has to be this dealing with evil conduct. How serious should we be about this leaven removing? I want you to go back to Exodus now, please. Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13. And verse 7. Exodus 13, verse 7. It says, Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. There shall no leavened bread be seen with thee. Neither shall be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And so the idea is this, that it it's, shouldn't be seen among them. Shouldn't be seen with them. Shouldn't be eaten. It shouldn't be seen, and it shouldn't be allowed in their own homes. So three aspects of it. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. Okay, so they shouldn't be eating any leavened bread at all in that time period. And so they weren't to indulge in something prohibited. Okay, they weren't to imbibe in that which was symbolic of evil. Right, and if leaven is the picture of evil, they want to personally imbibe in it. They want to do it themselves, and so the, the language for us would be this: You don't indulge in that which is prohibited. You don't feed on dirt. You don't eat that which is sinful. 
which is a feed on Christ, right? So, so I can allow myself to be involved in stuff that is contrary to the person and the glory of the Lord Jesus. I can't do it, right? I can't be looking at filth. I can't be involved in that stuff. I can't be feeding on it. Don't indulge in that prohibited, that which is unprohibited. Prohibited. And then secondly, it says, not only should it not be eaten, he says it shouldn't be seen among them. Notice again, verse 7. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee. And so they're not only not to indulge in it, they're not to even look at it. Right? And, and it's an interesting that in Romans, it, it talks about the thing, the evil things that people do in Romans chapter one in a fallen society. And it has this list of things. And at the end of it, of this list, horrendous list in Romans chapter one, it says in verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And most of our television programming is based on things that God says are worthy of death. I mean, the, the script of the average soap is what God would condemn as worthy of death, right? Wickedness. And he says, not only that, that not only do people do those things, they get pleasure in those that do them. So they may not be doing it themselves, but they like watching it. They're fascinated with wickedness. And that's, again, this is our country. We're fascinated by wickedness, right? That's what our program is all about on the TV. And so he says, no lemon bread was to be seen. You know, that, that, the great theology in that little children's song, be careful little eyes what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Because when you see something, it's hard to unsee it. We, we have an amazing database called our mind. And images that are uploaded on that database have a tendency to stay there and come back to your mind at most inconvenient moments. Like when you sat down at the Lord's Supper and you want to be thinking about the Lord Jesus in some image that is so contrary to the loveliness of Christ could come into your mind. You see, that's very inconvenient, isn't it? <laughs> it's so contrary to why we're here, right? And so be careful what you see. Leaven shouldn't be seen in their homes. And it's good maybe sometimes to, to go through and look and ask the question, how much leaven is in my home? Am I allowing in my home? Right? That is not, is it, is it going to draw me nearer to the Lord, you see? Is it going to make me love Christ more passionately? Uh, somebody asked me one time, can we watch this movie? I said, sure. I said, as long as afterwards, we're going to have a prayer meeting as soon as it's over. Is it the kind of movie you could watch and at the end want to pray fervently? I bet there's very few movies that would make you want to do that. <laughs> right? So, so th this idea is, is it going to draw me closer to the water or is it, going to, is it going to fill my mind with things that is going to really cause me to, uh, well, be filled with junk so that I don't have appetite for the lamb? And then the final thing is, he says in this verse 7, he says, Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. So they were not to indulge in it, they were not to see it, and it wasn't even to be allowed in their homes. And I'm told that Orthodox Jews to this very day will go through their homes and they will, uh, at the feast of, before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, They'll sprinkle crumbs of leavened bread around their house. And they'll go through with a brush and a, a shovel and symbolically remove 
all the leaven from their homes. But we're not really concerned about eating bread with yeast in it. We're concerned about what it's picturing, right? And you could you could go through that little ceremony and still have filth in your home. So we've got to be serious about removal of leaven from our lives. And it might be good to do that, to search our homes and our hearts to see if leaven is at work. How serious are we about living a holy life? Are we feeding on Christ? Are we removing leaven with seriousness? Now, of course, it leads to a great question. I have no idea because I haven't broken bread here since 1998. And so I don't know whether you, in your communion service, use leavened bread or unleavened bread. <laughs> Which? Leaven. Leaven. Mm -hmm. You know what? I think you're right. That might surprise you. After all I've said, some people, when they study this passage and this subject, they say, well, at the Lord's Supper, we should only use unleavened bread. So I want to answer the question, why we should <coughs> not use unleavened bread at the Remembrance Feast. The first reason is from the text itself. I want you to look, please at 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 23. And here's, here's a fascinating thing to me, that Paul obviously felt serious enough about the type of unleavened bread, but he didn't think it was serious enough to insist that we only use unleavened bread at the Lord's Supper. And here's why. He's already used the technical term unleavened, in chapter 5, we've seen that already, haven't we, in chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, where it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven. So he's already used this with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's already used the word for unleavened bread in the text. But when it comes to 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 23, where he says, I have received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. He doesn't use the term, he took unleavened bread. He uses the ordinary word for bread. Now, why does he do that? I know at the Passover, no question, the first Passover where they initiated the Lord's Supper, it was unleavened bread. But Paul could use that word because he's already used it once. But in the Greek, he doesn't. He uses just common loaf. I find that very interesting because he could have done, but he didn't. Same as Luke 22. Luke 22, same, exactly the same principle. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 1, he uses the phrase, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh which is called the Passover. So he's already used the technical term unleavened bread, but in verse seven, he says, then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. So again, he uses that technical term unleavened bread. And then in verse 19, he says, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. He doesn't use, then he took unleavened bread. He just says he took bread. Now again, if you wanted to make the point, do this in remembrance of me, and be sure you always use unleavened bread, it would say he took unleavened bread and said, take, do this in remembrance of me. But he doesn't. So why is it not that significant? Look at 1 Corinthians 10 now. 1 Corinthians 10. Because the loaf pictures more than just the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of the one bread. Here's the interesting thing. So 
that loaf on the table not only is a symbol of his own physical body, but it's also a picture of his mystical body, the church. We being many are one bread. It's a picture of us collectively as well, him as him. That interesting. Now, is there any leaven in us? Oh, yeah, there is, isn't there? There's sin in us, isn't there? Anybody here not, don't have any problem with sin? Anybody here sinless? Any, anybody had no leaven in their life ever? <laughs> we all do, don't we? So it's a picture not just of him, but of us. And even when we remember him, we're remembering him as being made to be sin for us, aren't we? Aren't we remember his death for us? And what was his death for? It was on account of our sin, right? It was on our it was our sins that were laid upon him. And so he that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know, I broke bread almost every Lord's Day now since 1989, unless I've been sick or whatever reason, but almost every Lord's Day since 1989, I've broken bread. I would say 99% of those occasions, it has been an ordinary loaf with yeast in it. And I can't ever think that on a single occasion, I've ever thought a negative thought about my Savior during those experiences. Or ever for one second, been caused to think that there was any sin in the person of Christ. If there was any sin, it was my sin that was laid upon him. That's been my only thought. And so I, I believe that the Lord just picked bread and wine, fruit of the vine, just because they're simple, common things that are available to almost everybody. I don't have to get too technical. We can just take a loaf and we can remember him. And we can take a cup, the fruit of the vine, and remember him. And I think we, we want to be taken up with the type, the picture, but not make it into something of a religious ritual and miss the whole point. And sometimes people who are so insistent on having unleavened bread, you find out later that they've got some real leaven in their lives and they're so caught up with little outward issues, but they're often a smoke screen for a bigger problem in their lives. And so to me, I don't have any difficulty whatsoever in tomorrow morning, I won't be bent out of shape at all if there's just a loaf on the table, in fact, I'll be rather happy about it. It won't bother me one bit. So we want to move on to the next festival. And so we've got to go back to Leviticus 23, just having dealt with a very typical, difficult subject, but important subject of sanctification, removing leaven and feeding on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Now, verse 9 of Leviticus 23, down to verse 14, it says, They shall therefore keep mine ordinance, lest they bear sin for it, and die therefore. That's 22. That's why it's not reading correctly. Sorry, 23, verse 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you become into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hin, and you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So these holy days, we've said they're shadows of things to come, but the substance is Christ. So the Passover... We've seen Christ, our Passover, redemption. 
On leavened bread, we've seen Christ, who is our life, sanctification. Now, we want to look at the first fruits. And there's a difference with this feast. It's very closely connected with the previous two feasts in that it occurred during Passover week. So you, 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 the 15th day of the month, right? We've got, sorry, the 14th day of the month, you've got the Passover selected and, and, and offered. 10th day selected, 14th day offered. 15th day of the month, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it goes for seven days. But during those seven days, there's a Sabbath. Okay? And the morning after the Sabbath, still in that week, is first fruits. So it's the Sunday, right? Of Passover week, they were to have this feast of first fruits. So it's still in this same time frame. These three festivals are all connected together. In fact, usually, so the Passover, 14th day, 15th to the 21st day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days, and the 17th day of the first month, usually, which was the, the, the morning after the Sabbath, Passover week was the feast of first fruits so what was the significance of it well first of all one thing about this festival is the others you could keep in the wilderness but this one you had to be in the land before you could keep right because it's a harvest festival and there's not much harvesting goes on in the wilderness right they weren't harvesting they weren't sowing, they weren't reaping, uh, so there was no harvest going on. So it had to be in the land. And so there's two big lessons that they, once they got into the land, they were to keep this feast. It had a kind of a twofold significance. The first one is a lesson in stewardship. When they came into this land, a land that basically God had given to them, a land flowing with milk and honey, a very fruitful land, and once they got their first harvest, the first and best had to be given to God. And it was kind of a lesson of, of stewardship. They were saying, God, we owe everything to you. And we want to give back the first and the best to you because you, you've given everything to us. You've given us this land. We didn't do anything for this land. You've given it to us. It was a gift from you. We give to you back that, that first fruits, really, of what you have given to us and so it's to teach us that god expects the first and best from us a lesson in stewardship and secondly and more importantly for us it's a type of the resurrection of christ okay and we're going to see that applied in the scripture very clearly before we look at that picture we want to think about god's portion what the feast meant to the israelite they're now possessors of this land flowing with milk and honey, and they're, they're in it, and they've got all this abundance. And before they can enjoy it, they have to acknowledge God gave it to them by giving back a portion to him. And so the first and best was to be presented to him. They recognized that everything they had was held in trust from God. It was a recognition of his ownership of everything, but he had given them these things to enjoy and they were to give back a portion to him. And, and it's true that everything we have comes to us from God, doesn't it? You say, well, no, I actually work really hard for what I get. <laughs> well, who gave you the smarts to do the work to get what you get? God did, didn't he? So, so everything you have really comes from him. He gives you the breath, the energy, uh, the health, the intelligence, Everything that you have comes really as a direct gift from him. And so we give back the first fruits of our uh, resources to him, recognizing he has the ownership of everything. Notice it says in verse 14, you shall not either need the bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that you have brought an offering to your God shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. So they weren't to enjoy any of the harvest until God had got his portion first. Afterwards, they could enjoy it in all its fullness, but he had to 
get the first back. And so that simple principle is that, that we're to give to the Lord the first fruits of what he gives to us. To rob God, as Malachi the prophet says, is to take from God that which rightly belongs to him and keep it for ourselves. And so we're to be those that give to God. And of course, in the New Testament context, on the first day of the week, they were to come together to break bread and they were to give to the Lord as he had prospered them. Right? Their first fruits. First day of the week. How has he prospered me this past week? I give my first fruits to him. And I don't want to rob it, right? I want to give back to him uh, as a showing uh, that I'm a steward of everything he gives me. And I, I give it to him on the basis of how he's prospered my life. And we don't want to be guilty of robbing God. But we said most importantly, it's a lovely picture of the resurrection of Christ. And here's the warrant for it. I'd like us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for our biblical warrant of seeing first fruits as a picture of the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> Several portions. Verse 20. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ that is coming, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdoms of God even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. Now, keep that in mind that twice here, it tells us he's the first fruits. Verse 20, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And then verse 23, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Now, keep your finger there. I want you to go with me, please, to 1 Corinthians uh, sorry, to uh, John's Gospel, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. Keeping your finger in Corinthians. John 12, verse 23 and 24. The Lord says this. <clears throat> Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So the Lord Jesus is that grain of wheat that is put into the ground and it die. But he came back from the grave, but it wasn't just him. Actually, when he came back from the grave, there was a whole bunch of other people came at the same time, right? The graves were opened and a bunch of people came with it, right? Because usually if you plant one seed, you get more than one seed back, don't you? I just use potatoes as an example. You ever planted a spud? Like you see the potato, it's kind of got all these things coming out where you put it in the ground. Do you expect to get one potato out of putting that one potato in? No, you expect to get a lot of potatoes, don't you? Out of that one you put in. You always get out more than you put in. That's the principle of sowing, right? You always get more than you sow. But that one has to go in the ground and die. If it doesn't, it abides alone. But if it does go in, it brings a lot of fruit. So Christ's resurrection is a guarantee there's going to be a lot bigger harvest than just him. It's going to be a big resurrection, right? He's the, he's the best, the first and best that goes in, but there's going to be a lot more comes out. And so that's the principle that's in view here. Now, there was a great protocol about this feast. It's the, Josephus would tell us that the sheaf was, was a, a barley, because it's the, the first festival of the year was the barley harvest. And that um, 
until the ceremony was performed, there was no harvesting to be done. This had to be done first before they could do a harvest. So what they would do is they'd go into and look at their fields and they'd find the best looking sheaf of barley they could find in the whole of their fields. And that was pointed out. And then what they would do is once they pointed it out, they would bind it, like how they bind the sheaf together. And then they would cut it down. And then, because they couldn't work on the Sabbath, they had to do all this the day before the Sabbath. Right? Because you can't work on the Sabbath day. But they would put it in a safe place on the Sabbath day. And then, the morning after the Sabbath, they would pick up this sheaf and they would wave it before the Lord as the first fruits. And if God accepted their waving this before the Lord, it would guarantee they could enjoy the rest of the harvest, you see. Isn't that a beautiful picture? See, as you look about among the, the fields of humanity, the first and best was the Lord Jesus. He was pointed out. And then they bound him. And then they cut him down, right? They lifted him up, but they cut him down. They, and they put him in, they thought, a safe place. <laughs> They thought it was really safe. They had a big stone over it. They had a Roman seal. They had a Roman watch watching it. But it came out from the ground, the first and best. And because he came from the ground, it's a guarantee there's a day coming there'll be a much greater harvest. And it's wonderful. I, I like history. And uh, for many years, I preached at uh, Greenwood Hills in summer. Uh, camps and conferences, a bit like Turkey Hill, but family con conferences. And uh, they used to always have a trip to Gettysburg. That was part of the deal. And being a history buff, I always took trips to Gettysburg. But I often thought about Gettysburg because it was a very interesting place. Because I don't know if you realize, you know, I read a, a, a really interesting book. I've got it in my library called, called Christ in the Camp. And it's a story of revivals in the Confederate armies during the Civil War. Now, most of these kids, and they were kids, teenagers, were walking in straight line formation, you know, into cannon fire. Your chances of coming out of there alive were pretty remote. So before they go into battle, they'd have gospel meetings. And they talk about eternity and the need to repent and believe the gospel. And multitudes of these young men were gloriously saved. And they walked to their death on the fields of Gettysburg into cannon fire. The Union forces, D.L. Moody used to have gospel campaigns amongst the Union forces. You're marching in straight line formation into cannon fire. And so, can you imagine? what the graveyards around Gettysburg are gonna be like on resurrection morning. There's gonna be a massive harvest because Jesus first and best was sown in the ground and died, but he didn't abide alone. He bore much fruit. In resurrection morning, there's gonna be such a marvelous harvest all around the world. Some of you have got loved ones you stood at their graves. You've wept to their graves. Resurrection morning, because the first and best was accepted before the Lord. They're going to be part of that marvelous, mighty harvest. And that's what the Feast of First Fruits is all about. It's not only a lesson in stewardship, we're to give the first and best to God, it's a lesson in security. Because Jesus rose, we'll rise again too. His resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. And isn't that a wonderful thing to be reminded? That one day, yeah, we were there. We watched as they lowered that body into the grave. But that body's coming out. 
Oh, it's coming out, and it's going to be changed. It's going to be a glorious body. It's going to be like his glorious body. And what a day that will be. He's the first fruits, but boy, he's a guarantee of a great, great harvest. Mm -hmm. Isn't it good to know mm -hmm. the security of it all? Christ, the first fruits. Mm -hmm. And so even the protocol of the feast. Now, here's what makes me smile in some ways. Because if you think about the Lord's death, when he died on Calvary's cross, when they would wave this before the Lord, they would wave it before the veil in the temple. That's how they would do it. What did they do on the true, when the true first fruits rose from the dead during Christ's Passover week? See, they'd gone through the ceremony. You know, they picked the first and best. They cut it down. They put it in a safe place. And now that first Lord's Day morning, if you like, the day after this, they're supposed to wave that thing. But they can't. Because the veil of the temple is torn. But they didn't need to because the true wave sheep had already been waved before the Lord. The Lord Jesus had already been risen and accepted. You see? But isn't it interesting? They couldn't do it. Like they can't do the Passover anymore either. Really, they, they don't even have a lamp. They just have a shank bowl. Isn't that interesting? Like, and that is God doesn't want them to do it because they don't. He don't want them messing around in the shadows. He wants them to see the substance in the person of Christ. So their whole thing is a sham anymore. But it's interesting how first fruits is used in the Word of God. It's used in many ways. It talks about we having the first fruits of the spirit, which means that there's more to come. He's already given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, and we've got the first fruits of the spirit. It means there's a lot more to come. There's a greater harvest coming. We're gonna we're gonna be with him. We're gonna be like him. We're gonna have to be changed to be like his glorious body. Uh, there, there's the truth of believers as first fruits. Paul talks about the first fruits in the care and first fruits in this area, first fruits in that area. And, and that's how people used to work. They'd go and labor in an area until they saw the first fruits. And then they expect God's going to do something here now. We've got first fruits. That first fruits is a guarantee there's more to come, a greater harvest. And so they would labor until they saw the first fruits. And so believers is first fruits. In the tribulation period, the 144,000 are called the first fruits. There's going to be a lot more saved in the tribulation than those 144,000. There's going to be a great multitude that nobody can, can, can number, but they're the first fruits. But there's more to come. And so it always has the idea that there's a greater harvest yet to come. There's a, a great story of a missionary to a, a good friend of mine, Paul Hansen, uh, is from this place called the Faroe Islands. And the Faroe Islands is part of Denmark, although they are very different people, it's a bunch of little islands. And uh, there was a, a Scottish missionary called William Gibson Sloan. And he went to labor in the Faroe Islands, which is primarily Lutheran, but they were as dead as doornails. They were, they were uh, like one step out of Rome, but really weren't safe people. And so as he went to labor there, he spent five years there, didn't see a single convert, and was really discouraged. He came back to Scotland and saw a great blessing, even saw revival in Scotland through his preacher. And he was wondering, should I even go back? Because I'm seeing blessing in Scotland, but I'm seeing nothing in the fair while. But he goes back after a year of laboring in Scotland, he goes back for another term, five more years. No converts. Goes back to Scotland, sees blessing. Shall I go back again? The Lord convinced him he should go back. He goes back for a third five-year term. One man got saved. First fruits. He was encouraged. He had right to be encouraged. That one guy that got saved turned out to be a magnificent evangelist. And now 50% of the population of the Faroe Islands are in assembly fellowship. That one first fruits was a guarantee of a great harvest. My friend Paul, he's one of those. Isn't it amazing? And so we need to labor in our area 
and say, Lord, give us the first fruits. Mm -hmm. Because when we get the first fruits, he gives us hope there's going to be more. There's always a bigger harvest. Mm -hmm. And it is true. You get one person saved that every person mm -hmm. has their own web of connections. We found an island. We would work and we'd see people saved. And, and then the next Bible study we did, evangelistic Bible study, they were bringing their kinfolk. And we had more people to deal with. And then we start another Bible study because they all had kinfolk that they would bring. And it just kind of kept going. And that's how it should keep going, right? First fruits, guarantee of a greater harvest. And so the principle of first fruits. And again, what we're, what we're saying, and again, I want to just emphasize this, our time is just about gone. But I want to just emphasize that I hope we're seeing that these feasts in the book of Leviticus are foundational to our understanding of New Testament teaching. How much did the Lord use leaven? How many times is the Passover mentioned in scripture? How many times is first fruits used over and over again in the word of God? Not just in Leviticus, but in the New Testament. And what I'm saying, I'm trying to say this weekend, is you'll never fully clearly understand your New Testament ever unless you have a foundation in the Old Testament scriptures because it builds on itself. That's the wonderful thing. Progressive revelation. God reveals the truth. And then he keeps developing it, building it, building it until we get to the climax, the book of Revelation. And we see these things in their fullest aspect. And so we want to see how the word of God fits together. So first fruits. And tomorrow is first fruits. Why we're not meeting on the Sabbath is the Lord Jesus was in the grave on the Sabbath, bringing an end to that whole system. But he rose again on the first day of the week. And he is the head of a new people that are connected with the risen man. And we meet on the Lord's day to commemorate the head who is risen, the Lord Jesus. And so we look forward tomorrow to seeing all of you with us to remember the one who's altogether worthy. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so grateful for the time we've had together today, for the word of God. Pray that our souls would have been encouraged. Pray, Lord, we'll be serious about dealing with sin. Pray that the hope of resurrection would grip our souls afresh. We're thankful that one day, because Christ has risen, we also shall rise or be raptured, depending whether we're alive at his return. Mm -hmm. And we'll see him, and we'll be like him, and we'll be like him as he is. Thank you for this glorious hope to tell us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks. Amen. 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 Amen.